So when I say it was telepathic, I didn't hear any words in my head. I didn't hear him talking to me. This is me in retrospect, actually, thinking about it with his mouth moving. What on earth could he be saying? And why couldn't I hear it? I didn't understand why I could see him, but not hear him. It wasn't, it was, that's really odd. Everything about it is really odd. So trying to grasp it is uh, difficult, but I, I felt I like the knowing, like he had the blonde hair. I could just see his face. It's just, I think in my drawing, I've tried to draw some, what looks like a bit of hair because I wanted to give the impression that there is hair. But it was right, going right down, it was on the back of his head and it's long hair. I think it's like probably past his shoulders. What a long, long hair. And I could, I just had this image in my mind actually. It was a knowing, which was sort of like an image that it was like in had short wavy short short waves and it's blonde like white blonde hair almost white was it white yeah maybe white or almost white but it had like this this uh, very frizzy sort of sort of wavy hair hard to explain I, I didn't draw I couldn't draw I didn't draw that like that that's a bit difficult that's one that very difficult to draw. So I knew that, he, but I knew, just knew, because, of course, this being is me. I am him, he is me. So of course I knew that, because it's me. So this gets a little bit complicated, but I'm going to go through it as best I can. That's what I mean by telepathic. Whew. If you're too, how are you being two people? This is the thing that got me afterwards. The phys, I felt the physical, you know, going back through the tunnels, back to being in bed. Because I had all the pillows stacked up behind me in bed. I was just sitting up like, like you couldn't lay down, you know, and all the snot and stuff comes down the back of your throat. You know, it's a really snotty cold. I just couldn't sleep. Yeah, I might have said in the book there, but it's after, a, it's like a, two or three days not been able to sleep really very well hardly at all you always do sleep but you don't feel like you sleep you just sort of pass out at some point so I was really tired and that helped to loosen the mind from the body etc I think and the same with meditation and that you're sort of just getting into a state where you're open to different levels of being or frequencies or whatever you want to call it I'm going to carry on reading actually because it's really important the next and this is the next heading is Guy Stephen Needler I was very confused after this experience it brought up some deep questions on the nature of my existence as you can quite imagine such as how am I here as myself but also existing somewhere else as a completely different personal being, having a life somewhere else at the same time. It was very perplexing to say the least. I found, as happens with me sometimes, that I am led to videos on the internet, on YouTube mainly. Well, they come past me often until I notice them. This is how it was with a video of a man called Guy Stephen Needler. There was a video of his that kept popping up on my feed. I thought it just didn't look particularly interesting, but something said to me, uh, it keeps coming up, I should give it a watch. So I did. And then it struck me that Guy had a fast knowledge of the structure of the universe the multiverse even, and could then possibly have an informed opinion on my experience. Why would I think that? Why would I think that because he knows the structure of the universe, he would have an idea about that experience? I think something within me was, I think we all know really the what the nature of reality is, what we call reality, 
and the insubstantiality of it and the depth of it and where we're all from or not from <laughs> where we're we all going how it works and i think uh but we're we're kind of dumbed down where we are as a physical human being i remember getting ahead of myself here i do talk about all of this in the book my my other self my if you like higher self possibly which i think turns out to be really the case has obviously understands everything and organized this meeting me showing me that i was him and he was me and it was important that he did that so i think so the understanding is i was getting from him or my higher self, whatever you want to think about it, whatever you prefer, uh, that I really need to listen to this guy, cool guy, <laughs> and because uh, he's going to help me to unravel this mystery and understand it. And the thing about videos, I haven't got this in the book, but many years ago, I might have to look it up, it might be about the time before I wrote the first book, or around that time, or before. I don't know if anyone has heard of Inelia Benz. And she first came out around that time, around 2010, 2009, something like that. And uh, she's a very spiritual lady. She's still on the internet and all that sort of thing. And she did an interview with, I think his name was Bill Ryan from Project Camelot. I think you see Kerry Cassidy is still going. I'm not sure if she's if that's called Camelot. Well, anyway, there was a project, and he interviewed in email. I think this was her first big interview. I might be wrong. And I, it was like that. I'd seen it come up on my YouTube feed or something. I just noticed it, and I thought, "Oh, what's that?" But I wasn't sure I was really interested in it. <laughs> Again, um, for the first time. And then I got this email. This is really, you might think bizarre or not. I got this email and it was from myself. I had an email that came from my own email address into my inbox. Like I'd sent myself an email and in it was the link to this interview with Danelia Benz. With Bill Ryan. That was really bizarre. And you think, well, did I send that to myself? Why would I send that to myself? I was just saved it to watch for later or something. However, YouTube worked back in the day then. Well, I'd, I'd never sent myself an email. I think I'd know if I'd sent myself an email with a link to it. But I hadn't. And so I thought, right, well, obviously I have to watch it. And it was absolutely fascinating. And she was a very interesting person. And she said that she, I think she said that um, she's come direct from source. And she talks about her childhood growing up and discovering sort of who she is and sort of kind of abilities she has and what she does. I found her really intriguing and I, I think absolutely genuine. I just got the feeling she was a genuine person. She certainly believed what she was saying. And what she was saying is very interesting. So if you ever see that, in Ilya Benz in an interview, she did another interview, I think with Buddha at the gas pump or something it's called. After that, there was, I think I found that since. And I tried to look for the original one. I recommend watching that if, if you want to go and have a look at that one. But that was, so me and the internet and things come up to me. It's, internet is like, um, and YouTube and social media and stuff. I know we have a lot of uh, marketing now where your phone listens to you <laughs> or your tablet listens to you and you mention something to someone and all of a sudden you've got 10 adverts for that thing because even though it shouldn't be, it's recording what you're saying and looking for stuff to try and sell you. And that is the, uh, the lower end of what that's doing. Not even the worst part of it, with all your data getting sold and 
anyone can listen to you at any time through any phone or tablet or anything. Anyway, but yes, that's the sort of the more modern bad side of it. But also, higher beings, energies can manipulate all of these things and send you stuff, obviously, <laughs> that you need to see or want to see. It can be a great tool for education. This, um, so that's why I saw this video keep coming up and I thought, I've not looked at this guy, I've never seen his videos before and suddenly I'm seeing his videos. And you could say, oh, it's marketing or something, but yeah, I don't think so with him. And it was one of those things where I thought, okay, I need to watch this. And when I watched it, I realized why I needed to watch it. And then I, that's why I, and then I had this knowing, oh, he can help me understand. And that's why I'm seeing this video. This is all working from a much higher level than the CIA or the Chinese listening in <laughs> your conversations. I had all the CIA and security services who are all out there listening to this video, watching me on this phone right now as I'm recording it. I know you're there, you know I know you're there, but it's okay. The invasion of privacy is total nowadays, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that's another whole other conversation, isn't it? Anyway, let's move on. Yeah, his video kept popping up on my feed. I didn't think it looked particularly interesting, but something said to me, it, oh, it keeps coming up and I should give it a watch. As I've just explained in my experience with videos and stuff, that's why I did that. And so I did, and then it struck me. That guy has a vast knowledge of the structure of the universe, multiverse even, and could then have an informed opinion on my experience. I know I've read that bit before, apologies. So in May of 2018, some four months after struggling to understand what my experience meant, I found Guy's email address and decided to write to him. After writing the portal experience explained above, which I just explained to you in my whole experience, I then wrote in this email to him. So it took me four months. I saw his video and I must have seen a couple of his videos and thought, oh yeah, this guy can help. It's, maybe this guy can help. But I don't know how quickly I, I wrote to him. You know, I'm just, like you're, I'm processing all this massive stuff, all these weird and wonderful experiences and what's going on and trying to process who I am, why I am, why I'm two beings at, two, at the same time. And so I don't know how long it took me, but anyway, from, from having the experience of writing to guy, it was four months. And this is what I also wrote to him. And I said, so when thinking about this experience, I am a bit confused in trying to find an answer for myself. And this is what I wanted your opinion on, if you would be so kind. I recognise and have for some time that these bodies we inhabit are just vessels for us and that we are here to experience and gain enlightenment, realisation, truth, or whatever label you want to put on it. So I had had quite a few understandings. I had been before, at this point, already been traveling Southeast Asia. I've become a Buddhist monk, spent a few years in a monastery, lots of meditation, lots of experiences. I had realized that I'm having a human experience, basically, as a spiritual being, as well as being, so as we are supposed to do this enlightenment, realisation, truth, or whatever label you like. You can put any label on that that you want. It doesn't really matter. As well as being beacons of light and higher vibration for the rest of the planet. Because this is also what I... I believe that we are, if you're of that persuasion, you're seeking to progress yourself spiritually with enlightenment. And you're trying to be a better human being, if you like. You're trying to further yourself and what sort of thing you're vibrating at a higher rate this was my belief so as beacons of light and high vibration for the rest of the planet to help raise the rest of humanity and the planet to a higher level very new age <laughs> i think it's true but why would i have see even though all of that i grasp and understand but i still couldn't but why would i have and live in this vessel here on earth 
but also have a different vessel somewhere else. As for me, this other being that I am looked like it had some form. Although to be fair, the silvery look could be that it is less dense and obviously of a higher vibration, but still just another form. Why have two forms? I posture that as the other silver form, I may not be getting the kind of experience that can be gained from having this more dense three-dimensional form and so trying or have been given the opportunity to live in this form in order to gain an even higher vibration and ascend to the goal of what it is that we are trying to achieve, whatever that is. Or am I, as this other being, the silver being, lying in stasis connected to some technology or awareness and living this life living this life as a sort of program that sounds a bit ai like doesn't it it's a bit matrix like isn't it the matrix the first matrix i love the first matrix i love the matrix movies the last one was absolutely pants in my opinion there number four <laughs> sorry but the first one was absolutely superb. And I enjoyed the other two, but the best one by far is the first Matrix. That was 1999, I seem to recall that came out. And that's like, if you really have a lot of experiences like I've had understanding, you'll realize whether it's deliberate or not, there's a lot of truths in there, as in like the program, you know, he was living, he had a human vessel in the Matrix but he wasn't actually living in the matrix, but his consciousness was living as a, in the human vessel in the matrix. And also, really along those lines, a perfect analogy is Avatar, the movie Avatar, James Cameron, where they had a human that goes into a pod, and we'll get to pods, immersion pods, and there from that immersion pod, but he's transferring his like conscious mind into the blue avatar and running around on the planet with the indigenous people, the blue indigenous people of that planet. I mean, wow, that is the same thing as the matrix, but different, but it's the same. A very spiritual message really, deliberate or not. How many people that make movies, that write movie scripts like that? This is a whole other conversation, isn't it? People say art imitating life or life imitating art. How many of these writers and developers of these movies really have a feeling about these things and are writing what they think is the truth of reality? Or are they just receiving it the way I receive information and others receive information almost like channeling from other beings that this information is being channeled into them for them to make these things, for people to watch, and to people, for people to start to grasp an understanding of the wider reality through what is one of the greatest things on our planet, the most widespread, which is the media, the media of movies, comics. I mean, comic books were, I don't know, so many good movies come from comic books. I mean, they've got the superhero stuff, but a lot of interesting things. But writing books, really good books and movies, I, th I think so. From my experience, I would say that it looks like it's the case. So then I got a reply from Guy after this email, and he says, Dear Trevor, due to my workload, I don't usually get a chance to answer so quickly, if at all, but I was drawn to your text and knew exactly what was happening with you. You are a secondary incarnation. To answer you in a more complete way, I have extracted the text in my book, The Anne Dialogues, to describe the detail behind the process of becoming a secondary incarnation. I hope this helps. For your information, the TES is the true energetic self, our, our higher self or oversoul or Godhead. All these names mean the same thing. It describes that much bigger part of us that remains in the energetic that our aspect, soul, is projected from. 
So the TES is how is a shortened version of the True Energy itself, which is how it, what he's written in his book. And this is an excerpt from his book. And this is the excerpt. Secondary incarnations. Secondary incarnations are a function of the ability of the aspect to move to a lower frequency incarnate vehicle when it incarnates into an incarnate vehicle at a frequency higher than but including the eighth frequency associated with the physical universe and therefore the multiverse as a primary incarnation. This is quite complex and wordy and I had to read it a few times to try and get my head around it but I'm just going to read, read it through okay. When an aspect incarnates into an incarnate vehicle that is in the eighth frequency and above, it retains most of its connectivity and functionality associated with being in the energetic environment of its TES, which is the true energetic self. This means that the aspect can freely commune with its TES and can manipulate itself and its environment at will. Although the aspect is incarnate, it will be, from the perspective of those aspects who incarnate into the frequencies that are below the eighth frequency, it's me, in the energetic state. So my perspective, because I'm below the eighth frequency and he's in the higher eighth frequency, he looks to me to be in the energetic state. This is why he had that shimmery look and in fact why he had the silvery shimmery look and he didn't look particularly solid it's because he was in a, a much higher frequency state of being and that is as much as i could see of him from my perspective luckily i could lucky i could see anything at all but i think he obviously lowered his frequency somewhat so i could be able to perceive him but in my consciousness so that's easier Probably not in the physical environment, but I don't know. Okay, let's carry on. This perception of the next level above a frequency being energetic from the perspective of the observer is a consistent perception that starts at the third frequency level and continues upwards to the 11th frequency. So what he's saying there is anyone from the third frequency level which is where we are. So the th what we call the three dimensions, he calls the three frequencies, the third frequency. And anything that lives in the frequency above our third frequency, they look energetic to us. We probably can't see them. And if we do, it's very vague. But for them looking down, they can see everything. And it's always the same. And what he's saying is uh, the perception of the next level above a frequency being energetic from the perspective of the observer is a consistent perception that starts at the third frequency level and continues upwards to the 11th. So every frequency below the 11th, looking upwards, you know, every frequency above the third. So the fourth looks to be in the energetic from the third, the fifth looks to be in the energetic from the fourth, a fifth energetic being sees the sixth as looking like it's in the energetic but they think they feel that they're solid and the sixth feels that they're solid in where they live but the seventh frequency looks like it's in the energetic to them and so on until the 11th please note here that at the earth level the first three frequencies are needed to create the environment of the earth and those components of the physical universe that are represented at this level can live can exist within so there is no similar function from the first in observance of the second to second in observance of the third frequency levels that are observed that are observed at the third in observance of the fourth and the fourth to the fifth etc so if there's a first frequency being the second frequency being doesn't look like it's in the energetic. And a second frequency being to 
looking at the third frequency being, the third frequency being does not look like it's in the energetic from observance of the second frequency being. The first three frequencies all look like they're in the same, except for the third frequency looking at a fourth. That's when it all starts, when the fourth starts to look like it's in the energetic. I hope I've explained that. I will reiterate again that the functionality associated with being able to create a secondary incarnation, an incarnation within an incarnation, is only available from the eighth frequency and above. So I am an incarnation within an incarnation. And only a being that's in the eighth frequency and above can have that ability to have an, another incarnation in a lower frequency. Getting back to the description of the functionality of the secondary incarnation then, an aspect will actively move its sentience and associated energies from its primary incarnation into another lower frequency incarnate vehicle if it wishes to experience an existence at the desired lower level and that that experience will enhance those experiences within the primary incarnation that it would not have experienced otherwise. The experience in a lower frequency incarnate vehicle is expressed as a secondary incarnation and not a sub incarnation as this the sub incarnation is a different function one that i will explain in the next subject heading no, i don't have here this is just the excerpt the aspect although i do have that book the aspect that chooses to enter into the role of being in a secondary incarnation also has the ability to pass on its experiences to those other incarnates that are working with it at the frequency of domicile of the primary incarnate vehicle. Do you get that? So the eighth frequency being can share all of his experiences with his compatriots that are also living in his eighth frequency environment. So all of my experiences here, my primary incarnation, because I'm the secondary, can share all of the experiences we're having here with others that live in his uh, level of frequency of being. Wow. This enhances the efficiency of experience by extending it to its counterpart incarnate aspects or colleagues. When an aspect enters into the secondary incarnation, it can either leave the primary incarnate vehicle in a form of stasis, leaving only 5% of its sentience and associated energies in the primary incarnate vehicle in a sort of caretaker role, allowing it to collect the experiences of the secondary incarnation and disseminate it to its counterparts or colleagues on an automatic basis. This has the effect of the aspect only truly experiencing one incarnation. So although he lives in the eighth frequency, <clears throat> if he's in this car, um, caretaker role, he's truly, I am truly him, he's truly me, and he's really just experiencing this environment as he shut himself off from his home environment. The secondary incarnation, until the demise of the incarnate vehicle that is being used for the secondary incarnation, is experienced, wherein the primary incarnate vehicle is reanimated by the sentient energies used in the secondary incarnation returning to it. So as soon as this body, this vessel dies, it is no more. All of my sentience and uh, all my sentience, what's truly me, not the body isn't truly me, this is just an avatar. When this avatar dies, all of me goes back to my primary incarnation, reanimates it and carries on there. Alternatively, 
the primary incarnate vehicle can be left in a functional state by the aspect leaving circa 20 to 30 percent of its sentience and associated energies within the primary incarnate vehicle and projecting the remaining energies into the secondary incarnate vehicle it has chosen. This is, although being classified as a secondary incarnation, the true state of the incarnation within the incarnation. It is classified as such because the sentience associated with the energies that animate the primary incarnation and the secondary incarnation can and does actively, effectively and regularly migrate between the two incarnations, experiencing both and controlling both simultaneously. In this instance, the sentience associated with the secondary incarnation tends to migrate back to the primary incarnation during times when the secondary incarnate vehicle needs to rest and remove the toxins accrued during its normal daytime animation when it needs to sleep. An interesting but basic fact of the use of the secondary incarnate vehicle is that it is regularly monitored by the aspect's counterparts or colleagues and is accessed for information on the levels of integration and functionality expected or experienced by the aspect in animating it. To do this, the vehicle used as a secondary incarnation me, is removed from its environment, in brackets when necessary, it is monitored and information downloaded from it that is useful to the primary incarnation and or its counterparts and colleagues. This action is one that is experienced on a regular basis and is the explanation for the experiences of many, but not all, UFO abductions reported. Blessings and best regards, Guy. This is what I've written about that. Wow. My mind was blown. Amazingly, Guy's words from a book he had written some years before were a reflection of my own thinking. Even using the same words such as stasis and for the primary incarnation to have, had, to have experiences in the lower frequency life that can't be had in the primary higher frequency existence. That is what I said in my email to him. Also that the secondary incarnation is monitored by colleagues to make sure the functionality and experience is going according to plan. Hence why sometimes I could have been taken, which has also been my experience with UFOs. I realise now that I know some of the answers guys provided here. Because I am the person that I met. So obviously, we are an intertwined being sharing the same consciousness. Wow. Mind blowing stuff. So that's still a lot to take in. And the book that Guy wrote, I bought the book afterwards, obviously. And it was written some years before I contacted him. And it explains exactly what my experience was. Just amazing. And there have been other, other things that also, and that the UFO experience, meeting, seeing the UFO when I was 12. And I knew the beings because they knew me, we did know each other. That's how it felt, but that's how actually it was. And they took me on board the craft and I don't remember, I knew I went on the craft, but I don't remember what happened. And they probably, probably had me on a table downloading information, body, how it's, how my body's been animated, how uh, my being is functioning within this secondary incarnation, etc. All of that is explained. 
amazing there's a lot more to this and a lot more confirmation of what he is saying that is true i'm going to take a break now but i'm going to get back and talk more on that but uh thanks for watching thanks for listening and uh i hope you enjoyed and get something out of that and this is something that everyone can think about certainly those who have experienced abductions and all abductions are pleasant people have all sorts of experiences so it's not always and he said it's just the explanation for some ufo abductions it certainly is the case of mine in my experience others have different experiences others i i absolutely well i guess but i'm absolutely sure come from other places and other species and other beings other frequencies uh, animating a body and have different reasons for being here and perhaps other people are abducted for different reasons because of maybe who their primary incarnation is ah right get complicated can't it all right thanks